what I'd like to do in this session, um, and sorry, in Eve, Eve Cochet, Eve, sorry, uh, to come and join us. And, and I'd like to sort of distill out the wisdom, not so much commenting on these presentations, which were excellent, but I think there was a lot of complementarity there, as we've seen. There's one, sir. A lot of complementarity in terms of the ticking the peak oil box, ticking concerns about the need for replacing energy uh, with uh, non-carbon energy as, as rapidly as possible. But the big question that I'd like to, to put to the group, perhaps uh, Eve, if I could start with you, um, a member of the European Parliament, a long-term uh, Green, former minister of the French government, uh, tracking these issues for many years. Um, as we look at individual ASPO members, ASPO as an organization, what do you think are the, uh, the ways, the most effective ways of getting this powerful message, this important message across to the key decision makers in, in government, in industry, and in the financial community? Because clearly we're having a problem getting that across. Uh, I think Jeremy's model is an interesting one at the national level, setting up some sort of program, a, a, t a task force that might lead to uh, to a government response policy or so forth. What, what, what do you think is possible at the European level? What would you recommend that we do? Well, we, we have some uh, resolution or directive or rules from the European Union coming from Commission or Parliament or Council. And I think the main uh, obstacle is kind of uh, socio uh, psychological for the elite of the politician. Even if some of them are aware of peak oil, climate change, or loss of biodiversity, anything, even if they were uh, profoundly convinced that it's a great problem for economical, political, social, and financial, if they think they are alone to think about that, and if they say, I'm, for example, going to the European Council and saying, me, the new president of France, me, François Hollande, I think that peak oil is the main issue for the next 10 years. The other one say, what are you, what are you saying? So I think it's an it's a, a, a image of uh, ourselves that it's in the uh, impossibility to do quickly collective decision inside the politician uh, game. But, on the contrary, uh, the parliamentarian, they are not really in power because executive and council are in power. The parliamentarian, including in the European Parliament, they are more ambitious and uh, they can uh, think about peak oil or climate change or loss of biodiversity. And we are three or four trends. For example, we try to convince, and we, 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 we win, that uh, until 2020, we have 320 goals. Uh, greenhouse gas emission less 20%. Uh, energy consumption less 20%. And renewable more 20%. Uh, I don't know exactly if we will succeed in 2020, but that's three official goals of the European Union. We have another goal, it's uh, what uh, the Commission, the European Commission say, the energy roadmap for 2050. Mm. But it's a kind of scenario unrealistic, because they have uh, to choose micro parameters to uh, to, to fix the scenario, and one of the parameters they, they choose is the, uh, the price of a uh, barrel in 2050, mm. and they choose about $70 in 2060, mm. uh, 50. So I don't think it's very realistic. Um, and the uh, uh, last one is uh, what they call uh, the uh, energy efficiency uh, gain, because of course we can have more renewable, but really, I'm, I'm green, so uh, of course I believe in renewable, it's very good, but do you think 
Well, it's a question for Jeremy, for example. Do you think that in uh, 2050, we got the same amount and the same availability of energy in Europe or in the world only with renewable? I think no. I think we can have about 20% of nowadays energy, but not 100% uh, with only renewable. So we have to face a new world where the availability and the amount of energy is less and less and less. Mm. Even if it's renewable, I am, of course, in favor of renewable, but I can't. So I think the, the new world will be uh, not so easy to live because the availability and the amount will be uh, not like nowadays. Sure, but in terms of the institutional response and getting decision makers to actually listen to this and to research further and integrate it into policy, uh, are you seeing any bright spots uh, on the European landscape? Yes, for example, uh, people are not convinced that uh, we have to shift you know, uh, taxation from uh, working on resources and non-reviable resources. So, it's a, it's a big shift because we don't have a community policy for fiscal, fiscality. Uh, we have uh, agriculture uh, union policy and a, bit, a little bit of energy policy, but no fiscal uh, union uh, coordination. So when you say, well, why don't we uh, uh, up the uh, taxation on energy, such that we, you can uh, down uh, the taxation on working people, it could be good. And I think it's going in the mind of the European Union, including the government. Great, thanks. And Theresa, turning to you, I mean, you're managing director of a, an Austrian initiative, which is quite fascinating, where you're actually funding initiatives uh, that are low carb, no carbon. Tell us a little bit about the Austrian approach to addressing this issue. How, how do you begin to try and fast track the development of, of non-fossil fuels? Uh, let me first uh, talk a little bit about the Climate and Energy Fund, just to understand sure. how we are working. Our role in the system is to support the Austrian government in achieving national goals. Everyone here know, knows that Austria is not that fine in achieving the Kyoto goals of 2012, but uh, we will go on the road and uh, we hope to reach the goals, the European goals also for the 2020 uh, uh, term. And we're looking forward to the 2050 terms as well as, as Wolfgang Streicher mentioned yesterday. So our role is to help to achieve goals. And I'm not a politician. I'm also not an advisor of politicians. Our role in the system is to enable new technology, to make projects possible, and to show that technology on the basis of renew renewables is possible. And is also available at a price which uh, leads to a future which is uh, possible for, for the population also in Austria because we have also in Austria 300,000 people which are uh, confronted with energy poverty at least today and if the prices we heard uh, go up then we will have uh, more of this poverty in, in Austria. So the role is clear we have to to force technologies to the market at least we have to, have to give funding for research and development of renewable based technology and to help them to the market entrance. And I'm very optimistic about the future in Austria. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to, to what you said, Mr. Leggett, also in 2050, I think we can be on the basis of renewables. We will have some problems in the mobility sector. This is very obvious at the time because there the development is not as, as good as we like it or that as we wanted to see it, but in the sectors of uh, warming the households and all that stuff, I think we will be uh, successful. So my, my look on the system is a little bit different from the European because also the Austrian strategy is different. Uh, we think that nuclear and, and the gas is not the future for, for the Austrian system. And in the roadmap, you know, it's, it's, it's included. We think uh, it will be important, and, and Michael Paula mentioned it, to think in smart systems also, to think uh, a synergy of different systems in, in the energy future. 
And uh, this is also not so a big point in the energy roadmap of the European Commission. I think the Commission is not so impressed by the activities in smart grids and, and in smart cities also, but we think that there is a lot of potential. And we also have some ambitious projects in the field of energy efficiency, especially in the industrial sector. And there we see that, uh, in, in, for example, in the steel uh, industry, we have uh, efficiency projects which, which show us that there is a, an efficiency potential of 10%, which is a quite a lot, with a combination of uh, input material and, and process optimization. So I'm looking forward optimistic. So, and then let's just go into a, a couple more examples then. Uh, you've got an annual budget of 130, 150 million euros. Yes. That's largely or exclusively federal money. It's not European money, is that correct? It's federal money, but we have uh, some projects we're co-funding uh, with that money, some European projects also. But it's federal money, it's given by two ministries. And I think we have uh, about 38,000 projects now funded since 2007, and this is quite a lot. Our funding goes to private households as well as to enterprises, as to research institutions, and about one third is spent for research, one third is spent for mobility sector, and another third is spent for the topic of market entrance of new projects, because as you all here know that the grid parity is not given for new technology, so it means you have to help them on the way into the grid at least, because we are talking mainly of the energy grid. Great. And, and just one more question. In terms of how much progress you've made so far, I mean, clearly you, you're funding research in, and, and analysis into the different possibilities there. Uh, uh, can you give us examples of projects that are actually now on the road and showing returns? Uh, projects on the road, we have a lot of projects on the road, but I would like to pick out uh, one project. Uh, it, I think you had some, some picture also. It's about biofuel out of uh, CO2 and algae. Uh, we are on the road that there is one Austrian enterprise which is really on, on top of the European enterprises in that field, and they're producing fuel for mobility out of, of residues and out of algae. And this is quite, uh, they have an export also to Arabian countries with this technology. So it's really a good thing. And I think this will, this is a potential of, the, for the next 20 years. Also not today, but in the next 10, 20 years, we will have a lot of that fuel also on the market. Great. Well, listen, let's go to a few questions because we've got uh, experts here from oil, uh, solar and renewables industry, uh, governmental uh, parliamentarians. Questions about how we can better affect decisions, influence decisions that integrate the peak oil concerns and make sure that we get a response before, if possible, the, the impact of it hits us economically and socially. Uh, yes, the lady here in green. And statements indeed, but again, the ground rules, please. Uh, very brief statements uh, in form of question or a statement. Yeah, I have a okay. question for Jeremy Leggett. Um, Carbon Tracker has uh, reported that there's actually a lot more uh, investment in carbon that can be burned uh, in light of climate change. Could you uh, talk about that and also uh, give an idea about how that would manifest itself? Um, yeah, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have time to, to talk about that, but in brief, for those who don't know this um, work, Carbon Tracker is a small think tank of um, dissident thinkers in the City of London, finance people, and um, I, I chair it in part of my spare time. And the idea is that what's happening at the moment with carbon is that the financial markets are loading onto balance sheets of companies and of course stock exchanges carbon that is at zero risk of impairment. The, the system allows everyone across the financial chain to treat the new discoveries of coal, oil and gas as though they are at zero risk of being reduced in value. And this is 
seriously dysfunctional when you hear some of the targets, for example, that governments like Austria have. Something is likely to be done. It's clearly the case that they are not at, at zero risk of impairment. We might argue about how much impairment they are at risk of. So this is yet another sort of systemic risk that is completely ignored by the incumbent system, let's call it modern capitalism and the capital markets. So these arguments have been quantified for the first time. It turns out if you take the basic IPCC assumptions, 80% of proved reserves of coal, oil and gas can't be burnt if we're going to keep the global increase in temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, 80%. And then, of course, all these things like um, the coming IPO of the Mongolian coal company and all the rest of it will load yet more carbon onto the, the, the balance sheets of the companies and stock exchanges. So I've been working on these issues, issues of overdependence on fossil fuels for a quarter of a century and I've never seen an argument that's got traction quicker. I can say this because it's not my own idea, it's the idea of people like uh, Nick Robbins at H HSBC and, and Mark Campanali and others and, um, for example, uh, I, I, if people are interested, you know, just send me an email and I will put you on our mailing list. But, for example, we had a meeting with the Financial Stability Committee of the Bank of England a couple of weeks ago. And we said to the guy, Andrew Haldane, the director who's responsible for the stability of the financial system in the wake of the credit crunch, we said, your whole system is behaving dysfunctionally in a way that could deeply undermine the stability of the capital markets. And his response was, you know, we really do have to look at this issue. Clearly there is risk here, leave it with us. So you've, you know, it's that kind of traction. The actuaries, we um, put out a report recently, the actuaries are so important to the valuation of assets right across the capital markets, um, immediately convened a workforce to work on it from within the profession. And there are other such examples. So. This is another way in which I think we can speed the, um, the transition. But, you know, if you believe that our task force, if you believe what many people in this room believe, um, if what we heard from Bob Hirsch yesterday, one to four years, <laughs> we, we're all out of time. And personally, um, I, I actually believe that we are not going to win this argument. I mean, I'm not about to give up, but I don't think it's possible to win the argument given the mental configuration of the system. And therefore, what's going to happen is that we'll be in the business of renaissance um, in the aftermath of the crash. That's my personal belief, whatever we do policy-wise. Thanks, and Jeremy. Simon. Uh, this is more of a statement. And in answer to the question you've been raising about where to get political traction, uh, my belief is that it's not at a national government level. It's at a city level. Um, at, at a local government level. I think the reason right. is because the political risks are lower. I think at a national government level, for, for, for politicians, it's not an electable... You know, whereas at, at a local level, people are on the coalface, uh, I think a lot more is possible. I think what we've got to be doing is getting cities on board one by one, getting a critical mass, and then it will percolate up to the, to the national level. That's my view. That's a terrific point. And in fact, I think there are at least half a dozen major cities' climate initiatives around the world, including the C40, that are doing precisely that with some traction. Shell. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to make a comment about uh, Saudi Arabia. I, in my book, Peaking at Pico, and I have a chapter, and uh, I made a very detailed analysis, field by field, for the country. And I also sent it over to Sadat al Husseini, the former vice president of Saudi Aramco, and checked, uh, he checked the data and he said, uh, okay, I approve what you're writing in it. Uh, the interesting thing was that the resource that Saudi Arabia was claiming for Philistine Abkaik was right. Uh, so so, so uh, there is uh, interesting things, but of course they can never go up to 50 million barrels per day in the production, but uh, they will st uh, can be here to 12 for a long time. But I, I'd like to ask you a question here. Uh, I mean, James, if you, if you look at this, what you have done here, you have had high positions within the oil industry. And why haven't you talked about peak oil when you had those positions? Um, he, di he did, I Well, first, first, first of all, I did. Um, I, I spoke at an ASPO 
in, uh, uh, I forget where it was now, Denver or somewhere. And, um, well, I, well, it was somewhere in North America. I, but um, I did, I've, I've carried these views all the time. And um, I, um, the real question is why BP, Exxon, and Shell and people don't, uh, nobody's interested in what I think particularly anyway. But if, if uh, uh, Lee Raymond or um, somebody said it's going to happen, then, then it's true. And the reason they don't say it, I think, is twofold. First of all, when you're big enough, you're advised by economists. And economists are not engineers or geologists. So they think if the price of oil goes high enough, God will put some more oil down there. It's not true. Um, I, well, I have. It's just nobody, can, nobody listens. Um, I think uh, Total is, is taking um, peak oil sort of view. Um, and I've heard de Marjorie say similar sort of things, but the, the, uh, I think um, by the time you get to Exxon, Rex Tillerson and so on, it's, they can't afford to say it. It would be too alarmist. So I, I understand it's a conundrum. I'd like to, while well, I've got the, the thing here, I'd just like to make a point here. A lot of the um, discussions being posited about, uh, uh, on carbon being a bad thing there is no science to this whatsoever. If you look at a greenhouse, right, you see right through it. So electromagnetic radiation isn't impeded by a greenhouse. A greenhouse works because it stops convection. And in all the models, um, in, in all the theories, they, they ignore or underestimate convection, which all engineers know is the, the most powerful way of shifting heat around. So, <coughs> Uh, climate goes up and down, it's unrelated to carbon. I, I can talk a great length about that, but... Uh, well, we uh, won't just hear that, Jim. I know, and I, we're here, but what I'm, what I'm going to say is there's room for Jeremy and um, all sorts of renewables and better batteries. You don't have to resort to hocus-pocus. There's just going to be a shortage of energy. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, just to be clear on what I'm doing at this stage, I'm looking for speakers who haven't spoken before, uh, and then I'll give preference uh, to them and then come to the others. We've got about 15, 20 minutes. So, gentlemen there, we've got a couple over here, then we'll come to the group at the front here. Um, just some, a small statement about the uh, carbon dioxide. Yesterday I've been to an event called Earth Talks with 700 participants where some climate scientists from the field He's working in the field, told us very explicit and very clear how much it is related. And the name of the greenhouse effect, you know, it's naming and it's misleading, as you said, because it's another kind of effect. I don't want to discuss this now, okay? Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The one would be uh, the metaphor of peak oil. Does it make sense? Because it seems very vulnerable to critics. Is it is it conventional oil? Is it unconventional? What is it? Uh, how, how is it measured? Wouldn't it make more sense searching for a new kind of metaphor that goes for the, for the basic information, which is it will drastically decline by 2030 and demand will go up like it is now? And this is the core message I'm taking home and not peak oil whatsoever. The first thing. And the second one is could it be a good idea to, um, on local level, implement uh, resource mappings? I know uh, one example from Upper Austria that uh, they, in a community, did some resource mapping in the local area and some demand mapping. And it totally opened their eyes because before they thought, on that level, that resources with that we have, we can go renewable. And then they said, no, we have to do lots of efficiency measurements because we could not go fully renewable on the same level of energy demand. Thank you. Great. Thanks. We'll, we'll take a couple more and then get reactions. So I've got the, the two gentlemen here in the middle. Yep. Yes. Thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Simon Davidson. I'm a PhD student in Uppsala with Global Energy Systems. Uh, this is mostly to Jeremy. Uh, you showed the Jacobson and Delushi thing where it's like 50% uh, wind power and a lot of solar in less than 20 years. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I've been studying that thing quite a lot. And um, I was just want to know if, 
Uh, do, you re do you really think it's possible to build that industrial ca capacity, have the resources, have the capital, and have th those growth, growth rates of those energy, of, of wind power and stuff in like 18 years? Do you really think that's possible? And do you think it's good or bad for policymakers that these kind of ha really realistic scenarios are spread around? Do you think that's that gains the, to get the policy that we need, or that if it's contraproductive to spread these scenarios? Thank you. Thanks. So, Jeremy, perhaps if you take that last one first and follow it through over, over coffee, because I can see that that's a, a long one, and then we'll respond to the issues of the communication suggestion and the resource management issue. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's possible. Uh, will it happen? I don't know, because of the incumbency that, that, that it stands in the way um, and the desperation with, with, with which it's fighting. But look, I'm not saying anything controversial here. The, these are disruptive technologies. And if you look at the history of commerce, disruptive technologies, once they get mobilized, go very fast. Look at the microcomputer, look at the mobile phone. And uh, you know, when you've got entities like McKinsey predicting these growth rates, you know, that 1,000 gigawatts of economic PV that I mentioned eight years from now, um, you, know, you know what it is right now. I mean, there's about 30 gigawatts out there in the world. So these are phenomenal rates, and I think there's every chance that they're going to happen because we will be forced in the aftermath of the crash, if you take the two scenarios that Bob talked about yesterday, the four and a four and a half, four to five percent um, decline, you know, that is going to send the global system into shock, and that shock will require policymakers to uh, do things they couldn't possibly imagine at the moment. Acceleration policies, and Eve's point, I think, was a very important one. I do actually agree with what he said. I mean, what I showed was a scenario getting up to an 11 terawatt world by 2030. I don't think we're going to need to get to 11 terawatts because uh, many of the policies will push us towards a world where, frankly, you know, we don't travel as much as we do at the moment. So you've got this immediate reduction in the, um, you know, load from, um, from transportation. And then all the other things that can be done, the vast reservoirs of energy efficiency potential that we can mine. I mean, just looking at the lights in this place and thinking about what's happening with LED technology. We can, they're disruptive technologies as well. We can really surprise ourselves. So yeah, I'm very bullish. And I don't think, and so are many other people in the renewables industries and still in the investment community, or else you wouldn't be getting, getting on for a quarter of a trillion dollars going into this stuff every year, much more than is going, you know, in, 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 sort of in terms of the speed of growth, is going into traditional energy technologies, particularly, of course, nuclear. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, quick response to the, the first question statement, Jim. What, what, could you remind me of that question? The, the first one was about the communication issue. It's not peak oil, it's, it's more the issue of the resource uh, running out. <laughs> Microphone. Although it, 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 uh, Jim, it, 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 microphone. Oh yeah, it's a pretty catchy title. I, I'd, um, it's, I'd say a lot of people would say that uh, black oil has peaked, and uh, the point I was trying to make is the tar sands and the NGLs and the, the other uh, liquids are relatively low rate, so you, you can loosely gather, put them all together. I, I, I don't see what's wrong with it personally. Okay, let's, we need to move on. Um, yeah, hello, uh, Radek Fengsch is my name. I have a more of a political question now. We've seen yesterday and the day before yesterday, for example, the figures in direct investments into renewables. In Europe, we have the first governments that are, or the first government that are headed by technocrats. Now, to the politicians and the policy advisors, in the transition phase, and if Dr. Hirsch, what he was telling us is right yesterday, do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage to be a democracy right now? Exactly, if you compare that to China. And, and the second question would be, if you're allowed to imagine for a moment, what kind of, because obviously we have a communication problem and a pressure problem on the politi politicians and on the decision makers, what kind of pressure would you imagine or dream about that we have to put on them right now? What could that look like? Uh, first, of course, you know, humanity, humankind try 
many regimes of uh, politics that, uh, as I think it's uh, Western Churchill, say, well, democracy is no good. But the other ones are no good at all. So we try tyranny, dictatorship, uh, empire, anyway. So, yes, democracy uh, is a real uh, uh, value in European countries. So I think it's the first one. If we, if we have to say, well, a kind of eco-fascism is, is better because you can, uh, you can decide for everybody, uh, let's go to renewable, let's go to uh, efficiency, etc. No, it, it won't work, it won't work. So I believe profoundly in, uh, in democracy. But it's difficult, of course, including in European Union, because we are not... I've been in India last month, and in India, they are like China, many people, and they say, we were some state like you in Europe, but in uh, 1950, we were uh, a, a union, uh, a political union. What, what do you, you, you are, you are not uh, a real or really a political union in Europe. You are late by, um, when compared with, uh, with India. Because in, India is a real big democracy with federal state, everything. So, and the second question is, of course, uh, my, my, my feeling is that, uh, we, uh, and it's an, another question of the, the guy uh, in the rear. There is not only peak oil, but peak nearly everything in the next 30 years. So you can invest many billion dollars or euro in new technology, but it, this technology should be replaced in 15 or 20 years. For example, a wind turbine, or a solar panel, or everything. Because, of course, the, the sources are renewable for eternity, but not the converter. The converter are, the converter, you, you, you say that? Converters, yes. A, a, any, any changing from one kind of energy to another kind is a converter or converter, okay. So, the converter, are, uh, they are globalized objects with many rare earth, or a neodymium, or a lithium, or copper, and all these metals are not renewable. So I think if you, uh, uh, if you are in the future, we can make uh, renewable and efficiency with low-tech converter. That very high-tech converter will be almost complex as a power plant uh, nuclear power plant is a, a complex and globalized object. But wh what do you think, Jeremy? Don't you think that uh, too much high-tech wind turbine or, or PV or uh, concentration solar are also very fragile because of the globalized uh, minerals, globalized metals? You, you, you have to, to, to got these things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in brief, I, I do agree with that. I think resource, other resources are going to be a big constraint, which is another argument for efficiency, obviously an argument for recycling, and um, you know, reducing the, the, the size of the, the mountain that we have to climb. Absolutely. Teresa, did you I want to I would like to add uh, on this democracy point. Um, we also give funding for regions, we call them climate and energy regions, and their model regions, they show, it's a, it's, it's, at least it's a bottom-up movement of people in a region which care about their resource situation, mainly with the focus on energy. But this is one of the points, and also about the city topic, you mentioned it. Uh, we also see in smart, so-called smart cities, that the inhabitants have a big role in that topic, and without the population on a at least democratic uh, basis, we will not have this transition of the energy system. And this is uh, an important point, but sometimes it seems that democracy is, is uh, making decisions impossible and all that stuff, but we also have to respect that a, a big thing is coming from bottom up and as an input to the po politicians. So I would not forget this and, and not always see the obstacles in democracy. Great. Listen, I want to take as many people as possible, so two executive decisions here. One is, with your agreement, we'll extend this till 11 o'clock, so that takes the time pressure off us. And the second is, um, only one question or statement, please, sir. 
My name is Witt Döring and I have uh, uh, one statement. When we speak about politics, um, I see that we should make first things first and one big issue is, in my opinion, uh, the taxation of US liquid fuels. What can we do about this? Okay, quick response to that. Well, I, uh, you mean it's not high enough? Why, well, I don't get the point. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's not high. Well, I, I, um, I, I think uh, all subsidy is theft. Uh, I, it's a very large country. They need uh, low gasoline prices to move stuff around. Uh, I, given that I don't, you know, I think carbon dioxide is, is an effect, not a cause, I don't see the point. Um, they're, they're using more than their fair share, you might say. But uh, as the price goes up, they'll consume less. And, and I have charts to show that they are, in fact, consuming less. I, I, on the democracy point, incidentally, I think you ignore dem democracy at your peril. If you think a political elite knows what they're doing and the others don't, that you're wrong. And I, I think a lot of the mess Europe's in at the moment is because there's you know, a lack of democracy. So the you know, elite go off on their own way, leaving people behind at their peril. So, I, sure. yeah, I, I, I have, I've, I have heard it, but, but I mean, I think China will implode for, for its own internal contradictions. I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a good model to follow. It, it had a lot of catching up to do, and you know, it's catching up very fast. But there's demographics. There's, uh, you know. Uh, uh, commodity inputs and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and a democratic deficit there too. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Marcus. Um, we've yesterday had an estimate from Dr. Hirsch that um, we've got one to four years and that it's gonna be something like a three to 4% decline. So my question is primarily for James. What's your back of the envelope calculation for how many years before we might go into decline in conventional oil, and what sort of percentage do you envisage? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Jim, just to qualify that, I, th I think um, Bob Hirsch yesterday said we didn't know what the decline would be. He said one percent we can manage, three to four percent will be disastrous. So I don't think there's any certainty around that. I, um, in what? In oil De production? Yes. Oh, well, I I think uh, the decline rate is is higher than that. I, I think. Um, uh, if you look at Norway declining at 7%, uh, I, th I think the decline rate's more like 5, 5 to 7, something like that, and it is disastrous. And, and in the, it's been disguised by the economic downturn, so that um, you know, US consumption's dropped off by 2 million barrels a day, for example. So all of these have relieved the, the tightness uh, pro tem. So when, when the, the economy, you know, if the economy picks up, then demand picks up. So I, I also talked to Mr. Hirsch. I, I see it in economic terms. He converts it pretty quickly to um, military. Uh, so so I, I see, I'd agree, sort of three to four years, it, would, it should all come to a head, I think. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Sir. Kazimir uh, Nemesh from the Austrian Chamber of Agriculture. Uh, I liked a lot the last uh, slides of Jeremy where he pointed out that there's a big interference between public opinion and published opinion and the money in between there. And I think we have a quite nice playing ground now in Japan after Fukushima where the nuclear industry is drained out of money and the public opinion is quite quickly turning as the money is not flowing anymore from the nuclear industry in the media to get their opinion brought to the public. So the question is, what ideas does Jeremy have to, with less money, get more impact on the public opinion? Um, yeah, if I had better ideas, I'd be a lot better campaigner and a lot better business person than I am. I mean, it's very difficult. Um, the, the renew for some reason, the renewable energy industries, and I'm not talking just about my own country here, but on an international basis, are nowhere near as effective uh, in terms of bang per buck as the conventional energy industry is. Maybe they've had longer to perfect it, 
and they, but they work so much better and so much more in strategic harness below the, below the radar. So what the, what the officials see in government is a very unified voice, often from oil, coal, and gas together. Nuclear is a bit different, but you know, they get, still get the same message, hold renewables back. We can't do a nuclear renaissance if renewables are growing at these speeds. Uh, with oil, coal, and gas, you know, they, they speak very often the, the, the same message and with multi-million pound budgets behind them. We are disparate. We, we criticize each other's technologies. There are so many people around who say, you know, my particular narrow renewable energy or energy efficiency technology is the bee's knees, everything else is pretty much rubbish. We're immature as, uh, as a collection uh, of people and, and really, really ineffective. And, you know, all I can say is, you know, I, I do my best, and obviously I'm a, I'd be open to any ideas for how we can lift, lift this rather dismal game that uh, we're playing at the moment. I think that can be all of our motto. Jim? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a sort of uh, back-to-front question. Uh, it shouldn't need governments. If, if it's economic, it's compelling. And uh, if the technology is economic and compelling, it'll go. I mean, it didn't need governments to push... Uh, the internet or mobile phones or anything else. So, as I said, all subsidies are theft. So, Jim, that's if, if, if it is wrong. competitive and compelling, it'll move. So, Jim, we, we solve the world's problems with markets. We do indeed. Uh, free, free untrammeled markets, yes, sir. But Would you have fought World War II on market power? Pardon? Sorry? Would you have fought World War II with markets? I mean, we did oh, in the form, but you know what I mean. I... I, um, I I'm unprepared to think about uh, what the cause of World War II. Well, who, I, I have an opinion. Who the microchip? How did we get the microchip? That was um, Shockley, Bard, Shockley, Bardeen and Cooper in Bell Laboratories. Uh, not governments. With military protection. With military focus. Massive military Luis. Okay. Thank you. But it's, if, if, if it's compelling technology, it'll go. But it wasn't economic. That's the yep. Yep. Thank you. My, my question is going right at this point. Uh, Solar power has become incredibly popular in Germany. And we have an, uh, another record last year of installation. And now we are getting close to the solstice. Day in, day out, we have a new record of generation of solar power in Germany. There is a slight little problem with this, is that when we get to 11 a.m. Uh, noon, the spot price of electricity collapse and many times goes negative. This brings Two, two very important questions. First of all, is how can traditional thermal power uh, utilities survive in this sort of market? And secondly, how can we generate a revenue for renewable energies with this sort of, of market framework? And so my question is, how can this work? Because it's not working at all, and this is the reason why the, the German government is suspending the feed-in tariff for solar power. They are very happy to continue with the, with the subsidies on coal, but they cannot simply afford to continue the feed-in tariff mechanism on solar because solar power is completely killing the market. Okay. It doesn't work. I, no, I, I think, and Jeremy and I would probably agree on this, that the, the real need is for better batteries. And as, 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 soon, as, as, storage, yes, as, as soon as people have uh, improved battery technology, then you know, the problem of excess that you can store it, essentially. Let, let me just, if, if, I'm, if I'm allowed, just add a, a point here. The, the, the issue is that solar power, it's, it's, by, it's by definition what we call in economics. Um, oh, uh, it's a, volatile. Uh, no, it's not volatile, but it's a, it's a price taker. You know, solar power cannot, cannot make the, the, the market price. It will never work on, the, on a scheme that we have today. We, it's, not, it's not a matter of storage. It doesn't work. It's a, it's a price taker. When I, produce, uh, when I produce electricity from solar, all my other neighbors are producing the price automatically, automatically collapses. This is not just a matter of, of storage. Some people can make money of storage. That's good, but I won't if I only have solar. Well, I, I'd say, I mean... You, you could uh, divert your solar, excess solar power to storage, I would have thought. I, I'm, I'm, I understand what you're saying about it being a price taker, um, which brings me to another point. 
is that neither solar nor um, wind power absolve you from the need of having conventional backup. Because they are intermittent, you have to have 100% capacity rotating all the time. And so they don't really save energy or carbon. Thank you. Great. Thanks. We have a couple here, and we've got one over there. Thank you. Ewan you, uh, you Marins. I'd like to make several points, but I will confine myself to just one uh, for Jeremy. Uh, the UK government does, in fact, have a policy document on the response to uh, peak oil and energy decline. So she's been talking to the wrong ministry. It's actually buried in the uh, last defence review, where there is actually a section on concern about declining North Sea oil and gas and the need for Britain to protect its vested interests using the Royal Navy to protect our oil fields that just happen to be located in the Middle East. So this brings me, this brings me back to the, the image that uh, Michael Clare uh, showed. And I think that's part of, the, part of the struggle, that the whole establishment is so set in its ways and in its minds. If you convince the uh, energy secretary to actually have a crash program in renewables, he might then have to go to tell the, uh, the Department of Defense and the Admiral of the Royal Navy that they no longer need the aircraft carriers that they have currently built to protect our, uh, our oil interests. Thanks, Ewan. Pierre-René Bouquis. Uh, I have a question for Yves Cochet. That's not surprising. Uh, well, for two reasons. First, Yves, because you are a member of the European Parliament, which is the body which, on the longer term, will be the basis for a democratic Europe. I, th I believe this Parliament today has a limited power, but one day will be the real basis for the structure. Uh, second reason why this question is addressed to you, you belong to a Green Party, you are ecologist, but you are anti-nuclear. I'm ecologist and I belong to the National Association of Ecologists for Nuclear. So that's a, a gap between us. My question is very simple. No, it's a fact. I just state facts. You cannot say no. I am a member of this yeah. association. <laughs> it may be lunatics, but it, it exists. We are a few thousands. My question is the following. You mentioned that obviously we must do as much as we can in renewable, and I agree with that. And you mentioned even a figure that we could expect to solve 20% of the world primary energy balance through renewable. That's very close to the figure I presented yesterday, it was 17%. So we don't disagree substantially on the potential of renewable. Therefore, the rest remain, 80%. And I say we have no choice whether we like it or not, but that a large chunk of that has to be nuclear because we have no other technology which is ready for the next 50 years on which we can improve greatly the safety in all the other aspects. And even if I take Jeremy's figure of 1,000 gigawatt of uh, solar, that represents only 120 gigawatt of nuclear in terms of gigawatt hour produced per year. So it's a minor drop in the ocean, even your southern gigawatt. Uh, do, you re do you agree on this figure? They represent the equivalent of 120 because they have a, an average 10% watt credit efficiency uh, per year on average, while you have an 85% average efficiency with a nuclear plant. So have the order of magnitude in mind, please. So, but if can you answer my question? Why are you, my question, why are you anti-nuclear? You are a scientist, you have a serious scientific background, very few members of parliament have that, so I would like to understand your position. Right. Perhaps uh, very briefly, because this is a, a huge subject on which there are many views, but look forward to it. Yeah. Uh, many scientists are pro-nuclear and others are anti-nuclear. So it's not a kind if you have a scientist basis or not. I think uh, my main argument anti-nuclear is that a kind of retro-history argument. Suppose that uh, all the nuclear industry and scientific discovery have been made in the 19th century. I don't think we'll be here 
to uh, spoke to speak about Pico, because we saw that humankind is not very clever about war, and we saw that, including in the most cultural and developed country in Europe, in Europe, we were the uh, the best in the world. We were the many with the Greek culture and Roman culture and very uh, clever. We, we saw that. We saw that in the 20th century, we have two world wars. And happily, just at the end, of course, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But we were not in the nuclear era. But try to think that during the now, this century, 21th century, if there is some struggle, some conflict, including some war, but now we have the nuclear, it will be the end. So from the anthropologic argument, I don't want nuclear, because the next one will be a disaster for everybody. And nuclear also, of course nuclear has no carbon, but nuclear has many, many disadvantages, for example, about waste, about uh, proliferation, of nuclear, uh, uh, you know, um, substance to make some dirty uh, bombs, etc. So uh, I, it's not only a kind of how many uh, uh, giga uh, giga kilo, uh, watt uh, per hour uh, between nuclear, renewable, or coal or oil. It's a, a, a systemic thinking that pushed me to be anti-nuclear. Thanks, and one last question. Hi, I'm, I'm Daniel from a small university in Sweden. Um, my, my question, when I come to it, will be for Yves as well. Can you um, come to it quickly? Yes, I will. Uh, it's rather obvious, I think, to everyone here that the reason that it's impopular to talk about peak oil is because it imposes uh, limits to growth. And no one wants to talk about that. So that's the reason that lid is on. But and my question to you, the Green Party, is why don't Greens around Europe push this more? There was a, a, a debate in the Swedish parliament um, just a few days ago when this uh, question was lifted. Maybe three people <laughs> were in the parliament at the time. Um, but why are the Greens not pushing this more? Because there's less of a conflict there. Uh, the, this, Thank you. Uh, Great last question. The, the Green Party? No, uh, uh, not pushing the issue of, of peak oil, because oh, peak it, oil. it goes hand in hand with climate, for instance. Yeah, uh, well, I'm uh, the Green Group in the European Parliament, and we have some people from about um, 20 country member states, but some of them don't uh, believe in peak oil. I know some German Green, they're my friends in the same group, but but no, 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 it's not a problem. We, we can, technology and market can do that. So, no, 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 it's not a, um, absolutely uh, uh, collective thinking in the Green Party, French Green Party or German Green Party or Austrian Green Party. It's still a debate inside us. So, that, and in the other party, it's uh, more dramatic too. So, uh, it's a pity, but it's like that. I think it's a kind of psychological uh, limit. There is limits to growth, as they say. But limits to, 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 to believing also. The, the thing, peak oil or climate change, are so huge, so immense in their aftermath, in their consequences, that sometimes ourselves also we say, no, no, it couldn't be possible. It's, it's so dramatic for, for ourselves and our children. And it is dramatic, but we have limits to, uh, about believing. So I think it's, uh, we, we have to try to make information, debate like uh, this conference, but it won't be sufficient. I think uh, we'll try to, uh, to think not only on peak oil or ecological problem, but just on what is the value of life, the collective life. It's democracy, friendship, and Mozart. That's good. Thanks very much. Well, Thank you very much for the panel.